Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Kevin Cosby here in Louisville, Kentucky, St. Stephen Baptist Church, with another powerful point to ponder. You can rise no higher than the way you think. So what you ponder is, what you ponder on has a great deal to do with where you are in life. Ponder the wrong things, you'll be in the wrong place. Ponder the right things, you'll be in the right place. So we want to give you every day something powerful to ponder from the word of God meaningful moments with the masters. That's what we've been having for over a year and a half. I want to thank you for journeying with us. We began on Monday on the heels of the 4th of July, which was on Sunday, a study of justice. And we've been looking at the most important justice chapter in the Bible, Deuteronomy 15. Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy 15 when he talked about poverty. He said, the poor you will have with you always. Jesus was not endorsing poverty. He was condemning poverty and saying that I want you to do something about poverty. But he was contextually talking about something that was being done to him prior to his crucifixion. And uh, Jesus, and you know, it's interesting that when you think about it, when Jesus says the poor you have with you always, and Judas was saying we could have helped the poor with this money. Well, what she did by pouring the perfume on Jesus's head was in fact helping the poor because guess what, Jesus was poor. I know that the health, wealth, and prosperity preachers have always told us that Jesus was wealthy and Jesus was rich, but Jesus was poor. And not only was he poor, but Jesus was oppressed because he was a part of a people that had lost their self-governance and self-determination by the Roman government. So he was both poor and he was oppressed. So when, when Judas was complaining about Mary using the perfume to help the poor. Well, she was using the perfume to help the poor because Jesus was poor. La yesterday, we looked at and we broke down Deuteronomy chapter 15. So if you didn't, you were not with me yesterday, look at Deuteronomy chapter 15. Look at yesterday's powerful point to ponder and point by point, we break down Deuteronomy uh, chapter 15. Now, the reason why we don't talk much about social justice in the church is because we have been given what's called a privatized faith, which is cultural and not Christian. And a privatized faith is a faith that is only concerned about me and my personal private relationship with God. And it does not affect my horizontal relationship with other people, it's private. Do you ever notice that the word private and privation come from the same root, private. When it's all about me and only about me, then that is what leads to privation. What is privation? Privation means the lack of resources, it's poverty. So when I have a private faith, I'm helping to advance privation. And perhaps no one has been more responsible for the privatizing of the Christian faith like a man named Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Now, you may have Martin Luther King Jr.'s picture in your church, but unfortunately, we have too much of Billy Graham's theology being preached from our pulpits. And Billy Graham's theology is a theology of privatized faith. For example, Billy Graham would, would preach a message about giving your life to Jesus but he would not tell those people at his great crusades back in the 50s and 60s that you can't be racist because how you treated black people was un not important in Billy Graham's theology. All that was important was my private relationship with Jesus Christ, having a private relationship, which by the way, hear me carefully, is not biblical. It's not biblical. Uh, if you go on the Billy Graham site, they have what's called the sinner's prayer. I'll tell you what, show me in the Bible where it talks about a sinner's prayer, especially a privatized sinner's prayer. And this is something I pulled from the Billy Graham uh, uh, webpage. And here's the privatized, notice the pre preponderance of the, of the personal pronouns. He says, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn my from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want, 
I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior in your name. But uh, amen. Now, I'm not saying that you you should not on a personal note uh, know God in terms of having your own convictions. It, it does start with the person. I'm not minimizing that. It starts with the person. Jesus said, except a man be born again. Each individual does have to be born again. It starts with the individual. But if it starts with the individual and stops with the individual and it's all privatized, let me say it again. If it starts with the individual and ends with the individual, then it's not the Christian faith. Because when it's authentic and real, it always leads to justice. Christianity that does not lead to justice, the type of justice in which the poor are being taken care of, is not Christianity. Luke chapter 18, Jesus talks to a very rich, wealthy man who wants to be a Christian. And in Luke chapter 18 and verse 18, notice what it says. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, good teacher, what should I do to inherit? He's talking about eternal life. Now, Jesus doesn't say pray the sinner's prayer. Jesus asked, why do you call me good? Jesus asked him, only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not uh, testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. So he, he's a good man. He's rich. He's a ruler. He's young. And he's moral. The man replied, I've carefully obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Watch this. Verse 22, when Jesus heard this, heard his answer, he said, there is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. Jesus made helping, doing justice to the poor and following Christ as synonymous. Why isn't this being preached in our church? It's Bible. Verse 23, but when the rich man heard this, he became sad. But he was very rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, then who in the world can be saved? Who can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible for people is possible with God. In other words, God can give a, can help a Peter, to, can help a, a rich person do what is necessary to become a Christian. And that means do justice. Peter said, we've left our homes to follow you. We've left our homes to follow you. Okay, let's just stop here. What I want you to see here is this, is that this rich man was told by Jesus, if he wants eternal life, come follow me and go help the poor, promote social justice. Billy Graham's prayer doesn't have anything to do with justice. It just has to do with my own personal relationship with God and nothing about justice. You remember Jesus says, I can get a poor man to do the things necessary to get saved. Well, when we looked at the 18th chapter, go over to the next chapter, the 19th chapter, verse one, and let's see if we can find a rich man who's willing to do what Christ says do in order to get saved. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was chief tax collector in the region and he had become very rich. So he's just the same way as that rich young man in chapter 18. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed, up, climbed a sycamore tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down, took Jesus to his house, and great, in great excitement and joy, watch this, but the people were displeased. He is gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, watch this, I will give half my wealth to the poor. So he's just going to take half of it and say, I'm going to redistribute it so that the poor can, can have the basic necessities of life. And then he says, Lord, if I have cheated people on their taxes, and that's how he got rich by cheating people, fraud. I will give them four times, stop here, 
as much. So he's going to do two different things. He's going to do redistribution and reparations. Redistributions is the first part. I will give half my wealth to the poor. That's redistribution. I have, and, and if I have cheated people of their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. That's reparations. So Billy Graham will have you pray the sinner's prayer, but he won't say anything about redistribution. He'll say, pray the sinner's prayer, but he won't say anything about reparations. But once Zacchaeus said, I'm going to do restitution, or excuse me, redistribution and reparations, please notice what Jesus' response is. Look at verse 9. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home. This man is saved now. And why is he saved? He is saved because he understood the social responsibilities, the social political responsibility as of a Christian to, to a brotherhood. That's what it is. Democracy, brotherhood, and justice. And unfortunately, we have reduced Christianity to a personal relationship with God that excludes how I'm supposed to treat other people. Well, my brothers and sisters, this whole week, we've been on a journey towards justice. On justice, we've been looking at Deuteronomy chapter 15. I find it interesting that there's only two people who went to hell in the Bible. Just two, according to Jesus, just two people that Jesus said went to hell. One was a rich man who wouldn't give the crumbs from his table to a poor beggar man named Lazarus. And he lifted up his eyes in hell. And the second is when Jesus separated the sheep from the goats and said to the goats, you get on my left side, left side to the sheep. He says, get on my right side. And here's what separated them. The, the goats go into damnation because Jesus says, I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was naked. You did not clothe me. I was in jail. You did not come to see about me. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. And Jesus says, in as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. How we treat the least, the poorest, the left out, the locked out, the homeless, whatever policies we have, be they personal or public policies towards that group, is the true measure of our Christian faith. And that is why Deuteronomy chapter 15 is the justice passage. And we will continue as Christians to fight for justice because it is our Christian mandate to fight for a much just and fair society because this after all is god's world it does not belong to the government it does not belong to a political party and it does not belong to the white power structure the bible says without equivocation in psalm 24 and verse 1 that the earth is the lord's and it is our responsibility to be good stewards of the earth and make sure that all people have an equal opportunity anything besides what I am talking about in this scripture does not represent the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for this journey we've been on this week about justice. Help us to get a clearer picture of what your will is for our society. Deliver us from cultural Christianity that is only concerned about our vertical relationship with God and not concerned about our horizontal relationship with the poor and the vulnerable. Oh, God, we pray for justice, and may we be instruments of that justice in our world through Christ our Lord. Amen. I can't thank you enough for being with me on this journey. And uh, the beautiful thing about the Powerful Points to Ponder is you can go back and, re and listen to them over again and take notes and uh, respond if you want to. You can email me uh, or email us here at the, ch at the church. But look, um, um, uh, I want to stress the importance of you belonging to a church. So if you don't have a church home, I want to extend an invitation to become a part of St. Stephen Church. Uh, email us, newstart at ssclive.org. We will get back with you. If you have any questions or you want to respond, email us, newstart ssclive. I'd like to hear from you. Well, today is Saturday. Tomorrow's the Lord's Day, and I'm excited about tomorrow. Uh, it's an important Sunday for us because it's the last Sunday of, of our our, our COVID-19 protocols in the sense that we've been away in terms of the entire church coming together. Uh, beginning in March, we, we, we shut down in March of 2020, and tomorrow will be the last Sunday 
in which we will we will end the protocol. So the following Sunday is the Sunday everybody comes back. So I hope you'll join us as we close out what has been a terrible, difficult, painful 16, 18 months. And we'll close it out and thank God as we say goodbye to an old era and move into a new era. You join us tomorrow in worship. Worship begins at uh, nine o'clock with the pre-worship experience. And then at 9.30, I'll come and I've got a word I'd like to share with you, some good news that you can use. Well, thank you for being with me. Love you so much. Um, I appreciate you. I get stopped in the streets and people are t saying and thanking me for the powerful points to ponder. I just want to thank you for journeying with me with the powerful points to ponder. And if you have any ideas or things you'd like to hear me address and talk about, well, just let me know and I'll do my best to address it so you'll have a powerful point to ponder. Well, look, you be blessed and I'll see you tomorrow. But until then, during COVID-19, stay, stay safe and stay sane, stay sane, and never forget that the omnipotent God is still in control. Love you much, and I'll see you tomorrow.